Hello everyone, Adam Cleary from 442 here, and in what was only the second silliest game I saw all weekend, I was at the old firm, don't worry about it, Liverpool managed to drop points against that Man United side. And in a title race where it literally looks like it's going to come down to who manages to not drop any points here, that is extremely costly. And the video today is about why I think the main reason for that is an uncharacteristic error in judgment from a one Jurgen Klopp. And I know, I know, I know, but just hear me out. All right, so this is the Liverpool side that started against Manchester United, and the only way I could describe their first half performance would be to use some incredibly violent and borderline problematic imagery. Now, you may recall just a few short weeks ago, this Liverpool side went to Old Trafford in the FA Cup, and the description I had at the time was that they were about as open as Will Smith's marriage. But Jurgen Klopp, ever the student of the game, to quote Roy Keane, clearly learned from this and set them up this weekend in a way that was far more likely to exploit Manchester United's big weakness and not leave them as vulnerable to the kind of open transitional game which is the only time Man United ever looked good. And the main way Klopp looked to address this was by making it very difficult for Man United to press them and pulling certain players into areas where they metaphorically just wither and die. Now Man United, like a lot of teams, will try and press you in a 4-4-2 shape. We'll just overlay some of the key players there. So what Liverpool decided to do, rather than moving the defence around to get extra numbers in this area, they instead dropped McAllister into sort of a double pivot with Endo. And what this means was that Liverpool had a lot of control of the ball in quite a deep area of the pitch. Like normally they would invert a fullback and they'd have someone here instead so Man United can defend a bit deeper. But by having that control with the defenders and two midfielders, They've got to push up on you a lot more. The main problem this caused for Man United is that Hoyland couldn't press both of these two centre-backs, so Fernandes had to join him. And by him jumping forward one, that then pulled Casemiro to make sure they weren't leaving a two-on-one here. And straight away, you can see why that was so effective, because now you've got Dominic Sabozlai just having a party all his own in the space behind Casemiro, who, if you've watched him play any football at all this season, he is going to struggle to cover all this area. I'm not, not saying the guy's legs have gone. No, I am. I am, actually. Yeah, his legs have completely gone. And you can see how effective that was, like, in his heat map. So Bozlai was nominally the right-sided number eight, but look at how frequently he was able to get into sort of central areas of the pitch. Like, obviously, he did a lot of his work out here in the build-up and whatnot, but when Liverpool were able to create the scenario to isolate Casemiro, create that space, so Barzai was just having a field day in there. And with Salah and Diaz pinning the two full-backs nice and high up, it meant that Harry Maguire either had to completely sit off him and let him have the ball, or push out onto him and leave like an eight-year-old centre-back he was in there with completely alone with Darwin Nunes. To the shock of absolutely no one, Liverpool finished the half with just, here's some select stats I found on the internet. They battered them, they dominated them, they put their face in their own birthday cake and laughed as their hair caught fire on a candle. So what the hell, Adam? What's your problem? Where do you get off criticising Jurgen Klopp? Clearly, he's made a really good set of decisions here that led to them dominating the game, and he did. It's actually a really good way to set up, but the problem was that they went in at half-time only 1-0 up. Combination of wasteful finishing from Liverpool and also some good individual defending from Man United when they desperately needed it meant that the game was still in the balance. This was effective, but it wasn't decisive. And the thing is, the mistake Jurgen Klopp made was not in this 11, it was in this 11, which looks slightly different because this was the side that lined up against Sheffield United during the week. And the problem is this man. Canate is undoubtedly Liverpool's best defender, who is not currently called Virgil van Dijk, but he can't play more than one or two games in a week. They've got to be really careful managing his minutes, and he started against Sheffield United, but not here. Instead, Jurgen Klopp put his faith, as he has done several times this season, in Gerald Kwanzaa, who almost never lets Liverpool down. There's no real drop-off in terms of ability. Part of the reason they're still in this title race with the injury crisis they're having is because these young players have come in and done so well, and he deserves as much credit as anybody for them being where they are. But the problem with him is that he is 21 years old, spent last season at Bristol Rovers, and up until the start of this year, had only started two Premier League games for Liverpool. And if you think I'm about to start digging him out there and saying that he cost Liverpool this game and his mistake could be so decisive in the title race, that's not where I'm going with this at all. I thought he was really good in the Man United game. I thought he recovered from that mistake so, so well. But the fact is, 
he did make it. With the score still at 1-0 and Liverpool understandably feeling very comfortable in the position they had in this game, they pushed on, they pushed further, they looked to get that second goal, but they took more risks in doing so. And then midway through the second half, Kwanzaa finds himself on the ball. There's no imminent danger, but he is being pressed by Rasmus Hoyland. He has a quick look, sees that Virgil van Dijk is an option, but in the few seconds between him seeing him and making the pass, the situation changes. Rasmus Hoyland has actually done brilliantly here to both press Kwanzaa and leave Endo in what is known as his shadow cover. Like, he's not marking him, he's nowhere near him, but he has cut off the pass. So Fernandez knows there's no danger of it going here, so he jumps quickly from Endo to Van Dijk. And Van Dijk clearly recognises this situation here even before it's happened, because if you look at him, he is pointing all the way back to Kelleher. He's telling Kwanzaa, this isn't on anymore, you've got to go all the way back, but... It's a big game, and he is an inexperienced player. It's not his fault he makes this decision, but he does make it. The pass is a little bit short, but Bruno Fernandes is not a little bit good. First time, he rifles this ball from fully 60 yards over Kelleher and into the back of the net. Now, I will say, Kwanzaa could make that mistake 10 more times in his career. It's unlikely it would land at the feet of a player capable of doing that, but... That's football, baby. So the question is, would Canate have made that mistake? And the answer is simply, nobody knows. Like, that is the beauty of football. Canate is way more experienced. He's unlikely to make that decision, but he still could. Everybody's capable of dropping a bollock every now and then, or he could score an own goal, or he could do something even worse. He'd get himself sent off. We just don't know. But you play the probabilities. Kwanzaa's lack of Premier League experience relative to what Canade's got means he is more likely to make that mistake than his teammate is. Doesn't guarantee you anything, doesn't assure you of anything, but if one of them's going to do it, it's more likely to be the younger player. And the warning signs of this were there from the very start of the match, by the way. Like, I know Man United didn't officially have an attempt on goal in that first half, but they had a quite narrow-ish offside one ruled out that's created entirely by Kwanzaa getting isolated. When you've got Connor Bradley on this side, you know he's not going to come into the middle too much. He's going to push right the way up so Salah can get nearer the centre forward. So it was leaving this space here. You can see Kwanzaa gets attracted over into it. That in turn pulls Van Dijk into this sort of area, leaving all this space here that Garnacho is able to get into. Again, does that happen if Canate is in the back four? We simply will never know, but I would argue it's less likely to happen if he is. Now, just hang on. This is the internet, so I do feel the need to clarify this before we continue. If you've been watching 442 on YouTube this season, first of all, thank you. But you will know that we have heaped praise in bucket loads on Jurgen Klopp for the faith he has shown in these young players. And likewise, we have heaped praise bucket loads on these young players for how they have never let him down, how they have sustained Liverpool's title charge in this vital season. But what I just cannot get my head around, right? And if you're a Liverpool fan and you have an answer to this, I'm begging you, please explain it to me in the comments, is that the match prior to this, when Klopp felt the need to use Canate, wasn't some European crunch game or some, like, cup tie or some tricky away fixture. It was Sheffield United at home, which, no disrespect to Sheffield United, is mathematically Liverpool's easiest game of the season. They won it relatively comfortably and had 80% of the ball. Like, if you're fairly sure you're going to have to rotate Kwanzaa and Canate across two games in that short space of time, for the life of me, I can't figure out why you do it this way around and not have Canate start here instead. Now, look, maybe I'm being slightly unkind here. Maybe I'm, like, catastrophizing that situation. But this feels like a Premier League title race. That is, I mean, just look at the table. Look how close this is. It's going to come down to which of these teams just occasionally don't get things quite right. And this is a small thing, surely. Like, Kwanzaa was really steady other than this. But just feels like a situation that didn't have to happen, and it's one Jurgen Klopp could have completely avoided. And the thing is, as well, while it's only one mistake that led to one goal, and Liverpool should still have had way more about them to go on and win the game, this goal going in had a direct impact on the rest of the match, which enabled Man United to get ahead. Like you can see from the way Klopp set up at the start, he was determined to be very good at playing through Man United, but not being too open at the same time. And even when they were sort of operating this way with Salah sort of moving in and Bradley bombing up down that side, 
they were in a degree of control of the game because of the way they were set up here. But now, the game is level, and they were forced to push McAllister further and further up to get him involved in other areas to try and get that second goal. And as a result, in what might honestly be one of the most savage instances of poetic irony I've seen this season, it inadvertently turned Liverpool into Man United. Like, as with the first goal, don't get me wrong, you let Man United have this exact scenario 100 times, I don't think they score too many of them, but it's a scenario created by Liverpool pushing up way too far and leaving that kind of trademark gap in the middle that Man United are known for. Casemiro blindly whacks the ball over his head. It could go absolutely anywhere, but it lands at the feet of Kobe Mainu and just look at the room he's managed to find between the lines. Like, Endo is here because Endo is now having to cover the entire central area of the pitch. He's gone where the danger is, correctly, but that's left a man unmarked. And yes, of course, there is loads that has to happen between Mainu getting the ball here and him sticking it in the back of the net, but it's a scenario that only exists in the first place because Liverpool are overcommitting, they're overstretching late in the game when their legs are tired, they are leaving gaps. And why are they overcommitting and overstretching late in the game when legs are tired and leaving gaps? Because they gave away the lead in a really stupid way. And the caveats to all of this are numerous and obvious. Like, if Liverpool just take their chances in the first half, that Kwanzaa pass doesn't really matter. If Kelleher's, like, five yards closer to his line, it probably doesn't matter. If it falls to the feet of anyone but Bruno Fernandes, it probably doesn't matter. But this is a title race of such fine margins. Little things like this can prove fatal. I know I've already said this like five times as well, but I am not lumping the blame for this result in any way, shape or form at the feet of Jarrell Concert. And it's just, you want good decisions to be made at these just crucial, crucial moments. And it's unfair to expect a player with his lack of experience to be able to make them all the time. I'll put it this way, right? If that exact same thing happened to Canate, which it could very well do, the one thing all the commentators would have said is why is a player with his experience making that mistake? The implication there being, if you do not have that experience, it's totally fair to make those mistakes because that's the only way you learn. And the mad thing is, it almost doesn't even feel fair to give Klopp a hammering for this because he makes so many unbelievably improbably good decisions. Like, he's by a mile the best in-game manager in football right now. And just to show you two quick graphs here, this is the amount of goals Liverpool score late in games, and wow, that's a lot. And this is the amount of goals they get from substitutes. And if you've been watching them a lot this season, you will know that the vast majority of these are from changes he's made as the game has developed and he has recognised things here and there and he's adapted to get the best out of them. Like, they even got one here. The Harvey Elliott introduction really did help open things up down that side and got them their equaliser. So it seems weird to be like, oh, he got this one badly wrong. But again, this Premier League is going to come down to these tiny little mistakes. And for the first time think he made one. So yes, am I being too harsh? I always try and find a really positive thing to talk about in games because fans like to hear what their team is doing well, but just analysing this and watching it back, this is the one thing that really, really jumped out at me. They did not need to let Man United get back into this game at all. And the way they did came from something that felt completely avoidable. But criticize I have and I know how the internet works so I will gladly take my medicine in the comments if it is needed. Please let me know how decisive do you think that change was. Have I got that completely wrong? I haven't had a chance to talk about this game with anybody yet so this could just be me so I would like it to also be you in the thing below and of course you can subscribe to us here on 442 where we do videos like this every most of the days, when I can. The new issues of the mag is still upstairs. I haven't brought them down. So Liverpool fans, look, Trent Alexander-Arnold is our cover star from last month. The interview's really good if you've not read it already. Check that out in all good news agents. Although it won't be on sale anymore. Um, ask them. Maybe they have some in the back. You can subscribe to our newsletter, which is also in the comments. That's very good. You can follow me on all the social medias at Adam Cleary, C-L-E-R-Y. The 442 socials in the corner of the video. And until... Whatever happens in the Man City and Arsenal Champions League games, I've been Adam Cleary. This has been 442. I still think you're great, Kwanzaa and Klopp. And I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.